So uh, some of you know I'm a, uh, a blogger, which is a fancy word for someone who has a lot to say and uh, no longer is able to write into newspapers, so has to do it on the internet. I wrote a post last year called I Have a Bad Feeling About This, and um, things being what they are, I thought I would also take some time to talk about some things that I have a really good feeling about, and um, I see I'm in the right place for it. You people are the best looking and probably the most intelligent of any conference I've attended. But you should know I don't go to a lot of conferences, so. You know. <laughs> so this is my thesis, and I'm not gonna belabor any kind of Star Wars references, don't worry. Um, I really feel like we are way ahead with applications compared to where we are with tooling development and so on. And I think obviously every programmer is interested in this. And as a result, I'm hoping that um, some of you will agree and or others of you will explain to me why I'm wrong and why everything's wonderful. I've heard this expression, the future is unevenly applied. I really feel like it is where software is concerned. Um, we have right now some fantastic applications. I'm 50. Uh, when, I, when I was in high school, we had a mini computer, and I actually learned to bootstrap by toggling three instructions into the CPU on the front panel. Compared to where we were then, the types of applications people use, the types of things I can do on my phone are amazing. I, if I could go back in time and show my phone to the younger me in high school, uh, the younger me would probably have a heart attack and there'd be some sort of time paradox. But if I went back in time and showed text editors and um, the way we deploy stuff with scripts and grunt and things like that, the younger me would go, wow, that's amazing, but would get it. The two things have not advanced at the same rate at all. So uh, for the next 35 minutes, I'm going to, number one, engage in some of that nostalgia that old people do, uh, then talk about why things aren't as good as they were back when I was a boy. And then I'll talk about where I think we could go uh, with a little bit of imagination and a lot of elbow grease. So, uh, oh, speaking of high school, yes. So the 60s were about data processing and computing. Everyone knows what that is, right? Huge batch jobs. Applications, you submit them, they're run in a queue, quite often a physical queue of uh, punch cards would be stacked up and run, and then output would come out of a massive 132 character line printer. Whoops, that's interesting. Um, and um, tooling was built, built around that. Uh, as an example of a tool from that period, I recall seeing a um, punch card duplicator, a mechanical duplicator, that would take a stack of punch cards and duplicate them. Um, I recall seeing um, something called a verifier. Does anyone know what this is? Um, a verifier, you take a stack of punch cards and you type into them what's supposed to be on the punch cards and it like rings a bell or something if what you type doesn't match what's on the punch card. So that if you're typing in lots and lots of stuff and you wanna make sure it's perfectly correct, you would just type it again. At sort of like a, a test kind of thing. And this makes a lot of sense when computing time is very, very, very uh, scarce and you wanna make sure your program or your data or whatever is perfectly correct as opposed to running it and then finding out it's wrong. Really primitive compared to what we have today. And some of you will remember uh, this, or you can ask your grandparents about it, IBM 360. I remember um, the Sanford Fleming building at the University of Toronto used to have a high-speed job stream where um, undergraduates would go, and you'd take your punch cards. Hello? Everything okay? Oh, yeah, there it is. You take your punch cards, and you'd put them in order, and at the very front, you'd put a special colored card that, that told it what program you were gonna use. So if you're gonna program in Fortran, they had Watt 5, you'd stick a Watt 5 card on the front. They had a list, there was a snowball, my favorite language of the time, you'd put it on the front. Um, PL1, uh, terrible language, all these other things. And then you'd wait, and eventually your program would come out. And if there was a bug, you had to go back, redo your punch cards, and of course, um, it was very easy, if you wanted to do some sort of genetic programming and scramble your results, all you had to do was drop your punch card box on the floor, and then your program was kerfuffled. Um, 
This was a more sophisticated thing, an IBM Selectric terminal. Um, I couldn't find the... <laughs> I couldn't find the, uh, the exact one that I was, uh, that I remember using with APL back in the day. It used to have the little Selectric ball that turned and you'd get different character sets, kind of like Unicode pages or something, but you'd physically change the ball. Um, really primitive stuff. But the one thing uh, that was clear was that both applications and the tooling and programming languages and so on that we use were in balance. They both were, at, they both were state of the art for the hardware of the day and the operating systems of the day. And of course, while all of this was going on out in the world of business, there were some people dreaming of the future. And uh, I believe uh, David Nolan was telling me last night about uh, synthesizers that use patch boards. And this uh, is Mr. Keith Emerson, who was uh, very uh, pivotal in the development of prog rock and, and its extinction. While, the, while all these people were doing data processing, other people were creating this. How many people here are familiar with Smalltalk? Okay, by familiar I mean have actually written code in it. I know I'm in the right place now, thank you so much. This was where it all began. And in one decade, they changed programming forever. Now, of course, some of these ideas had come for before. In 1971, there, they had an existing language, Simula, and the bet was we can do Simula in a page of Lisp code. The original small talk was implemented in Lisp. By 72, they had the language working with a completely different model than what we know today. By 76, they'd added all of the stuff that we now completely bastardize and get wrong when we do our object-oriented programming in languages like Java. And by 1980, everything was an object. It had become pure. But they didn't stop there. Um, Alan Kay's great quote is that everyone who's serious about software should build their own hardware. And they did. This is an Alto, the, uh, the machine that they designed when they, were, when they had invented mice and, and so on and bitmap displays. And that wasn't enough. They also invented an entirely new way of writing, debugging, editing, modifying, and refactoring programs. They had refactoring browsers in the early 1980s, refactoring editors, I should say. They had the ability to forget REPLs. Everything was live. It was a step beyond the REPLs of the day. You could go and edit. No? Yes? Shaking your head? No? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, everything was live. You could inspect an object, change it. You could change the code live while the program is in, is in memory. They had this advanced thing that today we kind of pretend we have when we get into Eclipse and say, oh, yeah, well, we've got Windows and menus and autocomplete. It's just like the small talk of the day. And it's not like, I don't want to pretend that they were the only smart people in the world. There were other smart people doing almost identical things. Bit mapped, high resolution, powerful machines with very advanced development environments, very advanced programming languages. And once again, there is this idea that the tooling and the applications were both state of the art for the day. So, we think about the 1980s, fully graphical, wimpy, what, I forget all the Windows interface, mouse pointery, whatever, uh, introspective and interactive, and document-oriented networking. This is an entirely new thing I haven't talked about before, but ins instead of just data and, and reports, now we had documents and we could share documents, and most of the things we talked about in those days were about word processing documents or Excel spreadsheets or, or whatever. And it eventually made its way into the mainstream. This isn't actually the original uh, 128K, but it's a, the Macintosh Plus is a fairly good re reproduction of, of the machine that was originally uh, released. And uh, this, these were one of its first words when it was introduced by Steve Jobs in 1984. Never trust a computer you can't lift. Wow, this display is uh, really cool. 
you know, I don't lose a lot of sleep about this stuff. You know, I, I fly across the, uh, the Atlantic. I remember to myself that my ancestors took the trip in the other way under considerably more cramped conditions. I remember, we, we nowadays call these things slide decks. Once upon a time, there were actual physical transparencies that went in a carousel. And again, if you dropped it on the floor, you were going to spend a lot of time on your knees trying to sort them. If it flickers a bit, I, I can live with that. So by the end of the 80s, apps and tools remained in balance. And, as you can see, in small talk shadow, although we moved away from that, uh, mostly because of the microcomputer revolution. We had less memory, less processing power, and so you know, we kind of stepped back from uh, things like small talk and focused on things like C, which would eventually evolve into C++. Uh, what you would call, uh, or what Richard Gabriel would call, a worse is better solution. So what has happened since then? since those glorious days of Ragenwald's youth. Where are we right now? I think hardware is amazing. Like, seriously. This is frighteningly amazing. Or the Samsung equivalent that many of you are carrying. Our software is this particular thing isn't that social, but we're social at scale, at huge scale, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, um, Trello, GitHub, all of these applications connect people all over the world. Many of you, I mean, if you stop and think about it for a second, many of you feel like you know me through my blog or, or whatever. You're only seeing me for the first time. 30 years ago, the only people who had this kind of experience were like scientists and mathematicians who'd go to conferences once a year and read each other's physical papers. And now this is an everyday occurrence for people. It's n there's nothing particularly, oh wow, golly gee, you know, I'm gonna fly across the Atlantic and talk to a bunch of people who I've been collaborating with in a, in a virtual sense for a year or two years and we've exchanged tweets and we've talked and, and so on. This is amazing. We have software that collaborates in real time. <laughs> Whether it be um, Sabitha Edit, you know, for text editing in real time, to uh, Google Wave, nice try. <laughs> Facebook is definitely collaborative in real time. IRC, everything, it's, it's, just, it's just amazing what you can do in real time. Google Hangouts, this kills me. Using neural networks to predict the weather, when I pick up my phone, and it tells me that r the rain starts in 11 minutes. I mean, to me, this is, this is, this is astounding. And uh, I, I'm into the Giro d'Italia, and one of the things that they've got on this web page that I go to regularly is for each stage, they actually give you this thing so that you can use uh, Google Earth to actually kind of like drive along as if you're riding the actual course of the race. I mean, to me, that's, that, this, you know, this is incredible what we can do. Um, Zed Shaw couldn't make it this year, so I was required to put at least one profanity in here. Apps are fucking amazing. Really. But what about our development tools? I mean, how often do we actually say, this is fucking amazing? This is honestly how I feel about programming languages today. We keep recycling the same ideas. It's not a bad thing. This is, this is about design now, right? It's not about really inventing new things. It's about combining the old ones and trying to find a better balance, a more tasteful balance. I mean, take Python, for example. Python is an exercise in taste. Ruby is, an, is a different exercise in taste. You know, it's an attempt to create joy. Um, closure is an exercise in, what, porting? A bunch of 40-year-old ideas? <sighs> Small Talk's 1985 browser plus Chrome and tail fins. I really think that describes what uh, IDEs are today. I think the original thing of this, I said they're lipstick on a pig, but I don't think it's quite that bad. I, I, I had to modify it. But this is the thing that disturbs me the most. If you were interviewing me for a job and you described to me, how would you go about architecting and then you, know, you bring out your particular pet elephant uh, project? 
And I said, oh, absolutely, everything in text files. And you, you might say to me, okay, that's very creative, that's unique. Can, can you elaborate why you think everything in text files is the best way to architect it? And then I came back to you and said, well, text files are kind of the lingua franca of computing. We have millions of tools. I can grep a text file. I can't grep a database. I can run filters. I can run Ruby programs. I can run node things off the command line. I can check text files into Git or subversion or whatever. Microsoft Word opens text files. Notepad opens text files. Emacs opens text files. Text files are just so damn flexible. They're the best choice. And all these other databases, they appear to offer some conveniences like, you know, really high speed search and retrieval. But at the end of the day, you're locked into these obscure data format schema and you can't do whatever you want with them. So the text file is clearly the superior choice. What do you think? Would you say to yourself, genius, we've got to get this guy in, fire our existing architects and have him redesign our, our systems? And yet, for the data we touch most often, this is our schema. Text files. And that's our biggest consideration. This is our holy war. I have to tell you, you know, if I see two people arguing spaces versus tabs, I feel that at most, one of these people is correct. <laughs> At most, one of these people is correct. To me, the proposition, I, I'm actually started to work on another tool, and for the, like maybe the third time in a decade, I found myself writing a, a language parser. This is a major fail on the scale of James Bond dressing up as a clown. This is the best way I can put it. We've mastered the art of optimizing hammers and anvils. We hammer an anvil better than anybody in history right now. Epic fail. Another James Bond. But seriously, you know, I, we've been doing the same thing for 30 years. What different result do we want? Now, of course, we have agile and pair programming and and um, JavaScript in the browser. I mean, lots of things are different. And just look at the applications and you see the differences. But when I look at programmers, what do I do that my mother, who was a systems analyst on System 360s in the 1960s and early 70s, what do I do that she would look at and go, oh my God, the world has changed. I don't understand what my son is doing. I have a screen instead of punch cards. Like, you know, this is not, I, I output reports that she would recognize I talked to a database in, in, in SQL that was kind of the new thing, but she knows how it works. I mean, really? Epic fail. I really feel like we're, in, we're caught in a strange attractor and we're just circling the drain, going round and round and round. Same ideas recycling over and over and over again. I don't feel that they're balanced. This, by the way, is a picture of the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. When you come to visit me in Toronto, we will go and visit this place. And in fact, in this particular case, the idea of something really old stuck with something new kind of works, the new crystal extension on there. But I don't feel that having our 30-year-old tools with our new applications is the right thing. And I don't think we have to just stop and just continue to tinker with things. So Dr. Alan Kay once described Macintosh as the first computer good enough to criticize, or I think he said the first production computer good enough to criticize. And I ask myself and you, you know, what is the first tool good enough to criticize in this century? I know what the first tool, the tools good enough to criticize were in the last century, but in this century, what would the first tool good enough to criticize look like? How are we doing on time, by the way? Oh my goodness. I believe every tool should be social at scale. I don't think, take GitHub for example, I don't think we should say that GitHub's primary feature is that it's social coding. I think everything to do with coding should be so social. 
It should be like uh, printing or uh, networking. It should be ubiquitous. It shouldn't be possible to write a tool that doesn't in some way involve social coding for the same reason that it's pretty much impossible to write programs these days, except for like, you know, two or three uber geniuses or whatever. But by and large, the vast majority of code is written by more than one person. So therefore, tools should be completely part of that. Not that there's this one part of the tool chain, you do all this stuff solo and then you do like some git merge cherry pick thing. Like this should be integrated into the entire tool chain from bottom to top, left to right. And when I say social, I mean social. When we talk about, you know, when my kids grow up and whatever succeeds Facebook or whatever, they'll be used to the idea of an intelligent sort of data stream of what's coming their way. They'll be used to the idea of being people suggesting friends you may know. Who's going to suggest programmers I may know or programmers working on things that look like the things I'm looking at? We need to mine. We have a social network with applications like Facebook, and it can be kind of creepy how that's mined, but there's a code network. And we're doing diddly with it right now. Like diddly. Like, I'd like to know, for example, is there some way for me to search and find out who uses the same combination of tools I use? I mean, this is the kind of thing you could write with the GitHub API and so on to do these kinds of searches. That should be baked into our tools. So here are a couple of things. Number one, there are times when, uh, when Reddit and Hacker News are useful. One of them is new tools come up and people talk about them and you go, oh, wow, yeah, that's, that's interesting. That looks like something I should read about, right? There's this whole discussion of new tools. And as long as it doesn't, you know, deviate off into, I don't know, libertarian fantasy land or whatever, some of those things are very valuable. To my mind, that behavior belongs with our tools. It's part of our tool chain. There has to be some way of capturing this knowledge of new things and who's using them and so on. Uh, fireplace wisdom, things like commenting on code. There's a thing where you can comment on a line of, uh, of, of a commit in, in, in GitHub. To me, this is really exciting. I, I'm now trying to imagine why would I ever, you can do, sort of do a git blame in an editor and so on. You know, I'd like to know how many people have ever discussed this function in this library on any medium anywhere. Like, that's something that's incredibly important to me if I'm trying to debug something and I, I dive into Angular or something. Like, we end up doing all these Google searches, right? You know, for this, for this function or whatever, find out if it's been mentioned on Stack Overflow and so on. I mean, this is something that ought to be, this fireplace wisdom, that ought to be part of our tooling. We are social people, you know, but we've designed tooling as if we're robots. Discovery and recommendations. Um, if I type require Angular, like, I know it sounds cheesy, and obviously we've got to find a better way to do this, but there should be something that works the same as people who, you know, required Angular also tended to require underscore. <laughs> well, but, you know, I want that functionality. I do. Um, check into Allonges. Oh, yes. And I really want to know who else is using something. I'd, I'd really like to know when people are, you know, on, in public projects and so on. I, maybe notifications, something, you know, but there's some equivalent of a Foursquare or whatever check-in. You know, all of these ideas, there's something in there for tooling. Again, I think real-time collaboration should be the default. Every single tool, all of them should have this. And when I say tooling, I've shown a lot of pictures of editors you know, because it's only 40 minutes, but every tool should be like this. We, should, we need to rethink the way deployment, rate tasks, and so on all work, and they should all be real-time collaborative. If we're deploying something to the web, we should have some way of synchronizing things, and right now we do the, oh, let's do a screen share kind of thing. These are like the worst possible hacks. Again, imagine, you know, some, you're interviewing for a job, and someone says, You've got a blank piece of paper. Describe deployment to me. Describe the optimum deployment, if you could just do anything you wanted. Like, would you really say, oh, yeah, and if there's a couple of people who have been working on this from around the world, they should get into a Google Hangout and do some screen share with a different app and then, you know, be talking on the phone? Like, this doesn't make any sense. This, there's no way we would do this if we had a blank piece of paper. 
and the knowledge we have now of how to make Trello work in real time and how to make uh, Google Wave work in real time and Google Docs work in real time and everything else. There's no way we would build our tools the way we build our tools. Um, I must tell you, I'm doing this presentation on an iPad mini, so if there's any hiccups here, unless they persist through the conference, my guess would be it's my choice to do an iPad presentation rather than a laptop presentation, and I apologize. It's very unlikely it has anything to do with anyone except me. Um, now, what I was thinking about escaping the editor, you know, again, I've shown a lot of pictures of the editor, but there's so much more going on than just the document you're working on. It's so easy to say, oh yeah, collaboration. So we can both type at the same time and there's like color highlighting or something like Sabita edit. But an example I read about some time ago was people were trying to automate an air traffic control center. And one of the problems they ran into was at the time, the manual system involved little stri strips of cardboard or paper that represented each plane. And people would write something on them, and they'd put them in specific places. And if somebody else took them over, they'd like move it. And what this created was a, this situational awareness where even when you're working on something, out of the corner of your eye, you can see other people doing stuff. And it sort of tells you, even though you're not watching them, it sort of tells you what they're doing, this situational awareness for the air traffic controllers. And then these busybody consultants from one of the big six you know, firms or whatever came in and said, oh yeah, we can automate all of this and put it on a screen. And of course, they don't automate the situational awareness because nobody ever thinks when you're doing your focus group and looking for your use cases, and I want to be able to see Walt when he's, I even want to be able to see if Walt's looking at something out of the corner of my eye, because that's how humans are. We're very, very sensitive to what other people are doing in the room. If you want proof of this, walk down the street with your partner, and when an attractive person of the appropriate gender goes by, turn your head even just a fraction of an inch. I don't know how it works in Norway, but in Canada, the ear, we're very sensitive to these little things. Who's looking at whom, talking to whom, interested in whatever. When you're working um, in a more bullpen type project thing, or you know, all at a big table or something, there's this back channel of information we're actually using. Who's doing what? In a project, we get none of that with current tooling. You don't know when someone's adding a new file or whatever. You don't find out anything until there's a check-in. There's all this stuff sort of outside of the particular file you're editing that's, re that's really important and that we should really get. Um, chat, voice, and video. So you're doing a Hangout or whatever, um, or Skype or whatever it is, and it's always a separate channel. So there's this video call over here, and then there are some tools over here possibly using some screen sharing. Now, what I find curious about this is that going back to getting to the 70s and 80s, people did a lot of work with um, trying to work on um, remote collaboration for ordinary managers and so on. Um, and they did everything from having little plastic heads that they would project you know, faces onto to try to make things work and so on. Um, but they knew a lot about situational awareness then, and they, they, they realized that, that you needed to do things like use stereoscopic sound to make it sound like when someone's talking that they're coming from a specific place in the room. Um, when we do our Hangouts and so on, they tend to be this separate channel, I think is, doesn't make any sense to me. It'd be much more interesting if, when you're going to comment on something, that the comment bubble appeared like in the text editor. You know, or the video chat appeared, hey, I'm working on this file, I want to talk about this. There's some sort of association of what you're working with. Again, situational awareness. This kind of thing is not something I'm making up. None of this, by the way, is, oh, Reg smoked this amazing bong and, and he wrote down all these dreams or whatever. It's not that at all. Everything I'm talking about here is stuff that is working today just in different contexts whether it be you know, confer conferencing uh, equipment for people who get together to you know, discuss how many people they're going to fire this year so that they can afford another billion dollars to spend on Tumblr or, or whatever. Um, or you know, some of the sound situational awareness stuff people put in fighter planes and so on, but it's all there. I especially, you know, returning to the subject of punch cards, we don't need to squeeze programs onto a single roll of tape anymore. I think, you know, typically software expands to fill the space available, you know, memory and so on, but our programs don't. As much as we may think that programs are incredibly long and whatever, this is a joke. When was the last time, like, how many people here have a gigabyte of code? 
one hand, this is wrong. Seriously. If we, if we don't have a gigabyte of code in here, I'm just, I'm just going to put this right on the line right now. If you don't have a gigabyte of code right now, it's because your tools don't allow you to write a gigabyte of code and manage a gigabyte of code. Everything else is expanded exponentially, but we cannot expand our ability to manage software. Otherwise, we would have a gigabyte of code right now. I think programs should be bigger. I think we should, by default, store the abstract or concrete syntax trees. I think that commits to whatever it is, our repository should be semantic. When I look at a commit, I don't want you commenting that you refactored something or moved a function or whatever. I want, I, I want all of that built into the software. I want to see it. I want whatever additional metadata that takes up, let it take up a gigabyte. Like what? We have to run out and buy another terabyte hard drive for 50 bucks or whatever it is these days? If it's not 50 now, it will be by the end of the conference. Um, right now, if you wanted to translate language, when I first went to school and was bumping around with AI, it was all about rules and prologue and logic and so on. Today, what's the best way we have of translating language? Hint. It's big data. We just look at large numbers of corpuses and then we just guess statistically. We refine those guesses and, and train and tune them, but we guess. Then we programmers, we programmers, we figured out how to do that with translating human languages. Then when it comes to transforming a program, we get together and argue about why you should have all these type declarations because that makes automatic refactoring work. This makes no sense to me. It's like the cobbler's children walking around bare feet. We should be able to do statistical refactoring. We should just be able to say, well, you know, We've looked at, at terabytes of code that's checked into GitHub or whatever, and when people want to do this, it generally looks like this, and this looks the same way, so here are the three most common uh, options you should have. Pick one or, or edit your own. Or whatever the interface is, we should just guess it based on large amounts of data rather than working with if statements. We know how to do it. Likewise with you know machine learning. We have machine learning. We have the brightest minds of a generation figuring out how to get you to be 1% more likely to click on an ad. If we took 1% of those brains and put them to um, you being 1% less likely to, have, to having um, a bug, and again, if you just think of it statistically, not in terms of if statements, how to write a, uh, a type system so that you can't have an error, like this to me is incredibly important, and, I, and by all means, you continue to use these tools. But from the way I observe things working in the application domain, we have this, un, this untapped potential of things we've learned that we could use. Just never mind making the bug impossible. Just make it 50% less likely through statistics and machine learning. I'll take that. So uh, this is my summary of where I think we need to go with tools. Social at scale, collaborative, big data, and kill text. Short order. So when I hallucinate like this, a little voice in my head tells me that stuff is too far away. Hmm, apparently hardware isn't that brilliant. But I know it's all right here. We just need to connect the dots between the stuff we're already doing in the application domain and what we're doing with tooling and development. We know how to do all of this. There are papers out there. You can Google it. We've already written software on this scale. The one caveat is you can't ask a programmer how to write software development tools not even the illustrious Sandy Metz. For the same reason, Henry Ford is supposed to have said, if I'd asked you know, my customers what they would, would have wanted, they would have said faster horses. That's the apocryphal saying. And I believe that's true. If you ask a programmer what they want, you know, they'll just say the same thing I have now, only better. And anytime you ask someone who's been programming for 30 years, like me, I'm the wrong person to ask. I've got 30 years of baggage I'm dragging around. I believe you have to design for people 
who don't have any baggage. When small talk was written, the people who would embrace object-oriented programming in the mainstream were children at that time. Really. The people who would end up coding in the late 80s and 90s, 2000, who'd start using Java and so on, who'd run around talking about dependency injection, those people were, were children or not even born when Smalltalk was first created. If you're creating this type of tool, you have to think to yourself, my market are children who are learning computing on iPads right now. So, if this is of interest to you, I'll leave you with one final thought, which, again, is definitely not mine. Do not fall in the footsteps of the people that came before us. Seek what they sought. Thanks very much. Do we have time? <laughs> Questions, flames, vegetables? Uh, room for questions, by the way. Um, ask for the mic, please. We're going to record the questions. Anyone? There is one treat for the best question. The best question after each talk gets one of these. That's a five bucks. Oh, That's not going to be the best question. <laughs> <laughs> so if that was the only question, you're in luck. <laughs> oh, I want to win that. So do you really want like a monster editor that does everything, where you're kind of locked into a single way of doing things instead of having multiple tools and be able to choose? I'm tempted to be really sleazy like a consultant now and say, how would you design this system? Um, no, I don't necessarily believe that. Um, we have done a great job with things like libraries of building interoperable software in, um, in open source. I think um, I, these are capabilities that I want the complete tool chain to have. Uh, in the 80s, we definitely would have built one integrated thing. That's how people build, like, you know, Lotus 123, then became, you know, Symphony and these suites and so on. I think today we would approach it a different way, and, you know, we'd get together and we'd have these committees that would meet over breakfast and talk about standards like HTML, and a bunch of messy people would go off and do stuff, and then you'd ratify it after the fact, and it would be messy. But I think, so I do believe that we can make these out of decentralized parts, but it might be something like the next programming language um, might learn something from Lisp and think about this, and it might say, we're just going to define like the standard AST, and then each tool can do what it wants, but you have to save an AST, you know, or a concrete syntax tree rather than just text. You know, it might define that as part of, part of it, and then individual tools might have their own way of working you know, with the tree, but I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, hopefully, you know. And we have another question have for you? Um, so I agree on, on the social context and help within the tooling, um, but at the same time, and, and we we're talking about speed and performance and all that, so why would I want one gigabyte of code? Like, we're, we're all moving in the direction of, of you know, having less code and more performant code and, and the bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and sharing things. And I'm not sure that our, well, of course, that, that's sort of the gist of your talk, but I'm not sure our tooling, but not only tooling but network and, mm -hmm. and bandwidth and infrastructure is ready for that like we're not going to have google fiber in africa for whatever 20 years um so i i agree but i think there's also a risk that we're going to go too far with oh we have as much disk space as we want fill it up uh, right so wh where would you see like the the balance between um helpful code or more space use mm -hmm. versus the, the actual physical problem with it? Um, that's, that is a great question. Um, actually, two, both of these are great questions. Uh, I think, uh, for one thing, when you mentioned in Africa, that's, you know, one of the things that's very dear to me is democratizing more code. Not just, you know, when I say writing software for that kid on the tablet, one day these inexpensive phones with Firefox OS or whatever may be everywhere. And one of my dreams is that you'll be able to write code like this on there. So one of the problems we may want to solve is 
doing something like all this work on the server and there's only, you know, there's some way to do it in a sort of headless way, just using, a, you know, whatever succeeds our current browser technology and so on. Because I really think, I mean, not only do I believe in these capabilities, but I also believe that the requirement to buy an expensive computer and have a hard disk and so on is, is counter, counter to where I'd like to see humanity going. You know, I'd really love it if you could, you know, just sit down and code without a lot of yak shaving. RVM and uh, how does that work with Bundler and um, what is your path to your gems and oh, you put it in slash user slash whatever, whereas you should have put it in, like I, I'd like all of those to go away, you know, so that muggles like myself can be more uh, comfortable with the, the code. So it's a great question and it's a hard problem to solve, but I, I do believe it needs to be solved, um, not just in terms of our current um, practicalities, but also in terms of one day bringing another 100 million programmers online, people who have the, the aptitude and so on, but don't have access to Google Fiber or don't have the money for, for computers and so on. So, yeah. Uh, what do you think is the best current tooling support we have for programmers? For example, Cloud9 IDE or something like that? Um, I, the problem I have with a lot of our current stuff is that you know, we're, we're really like chained, like I, that big luggage cart, by, you know, the need to interoperate with all the existing legacy stuff we have. And so, you know, if I were to criticize this thing or that thing or the other thing, you know, I, in a vacuum, you know, without taking into account the realities of what you need to do in order to be, you know, in order to be successful. Um, to be honest with you, as much as this talk sort of criticizes the tooling, uh, and so on. It's more of a talk about the potential. I, I, it's, I, I don't, I don't, I, I kind of feel like there's this vacuum that's building up, you know, and, this, and you know, we're holding it back, holding back, holding back, but, you know, the doors are going to burst open and we're going to be, you know, whoosh, rocket forward with a sudden great leap of, of tooling. So in terms of the current uh, things, the thing I'm, I actually didn't know that there was going to be a big Firefox OS thing, but to be honest with you, I'm very excited about this. You know, of all the things, I'm very, very, very excited about the idea of of, of a browser type um, OS on inexpensive, and this is a key to me, on inexpensive hardware that can be pushed out. That excites me more than any other specific thing. I really think there's this huge potential for um, a, a completely new class of people. Like I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, and they're comfortable with an, with an iPad. You know, so to me, I mean, I'm an anomaly. You know. <laughs> Futzing around with a mini computer in the 1970s. These are the kids of the next generation, and things like Firefox OS to me are pointing the direction of what they might be working with, as opposed to what we are currently working with. And um, so that's that's what I personally find, you know, the exciting the exciting direction that that tooling and, and applications will, could go in. Do we have time for any more, or is that that's it? <laughs>